Good morning, everybody. How is everyone out there today? Hope everybody's uh, well. Um, just a quick update and everything like that. Um, we're just having a little technical issue. Marisa is working on uh, setting, fixing up uh, something real quick. Once she's uh, ready, we'll start off. So we're going to be just a couple minutes delay today. Sorry about that. But in the meantime, let's check in and see what's going on and everything like that with everybody. I just had the chat open. All right. So this week we're going to be doing, uh, we've got Shark Week. So welcome to Shark Week. Um, we've got some really, really awesome uh, talks this week and everything like that. Um, we're going to kick it off today with a talk from uh, Dr. Mauricio Hoyas, um, who's telling, uh, teaching us about uh, great whites in Mexico and uh, some of the awesome research they've been working on and all that kind of cool stuff. Um, then tomorrow we're going to start our new mini series with uh, shark conservationist Liz Parkinson. It's called Coffee Break. Um, Coffee Break is kind of this new idea we came up with to kind of look at some of the human story behind the, the actual stories that you see on Ocean Stories. Um, so we're going to be doing this maybe once a week or once every other week to kind of just look at some of the, the story behind the people we've had on here. Um, like tomorrow with Liz, we're going to be looking at, you know, how she got into shark conservation, um, how she, you know, what started it, what inspired her to do this and, you know, make this her, her passion and her life and all that kind of stuff. Um, so lots of really cool stuff coming with that. You can actually post uh, questions and comments and stuff like that on the, our social media posts about Coffee Break. You'll find them on Instagram, on the Dive Ninjas Instagram and Facebook. Um, and then what we're doing is we're actually picking some of the comments or some of the questions and everything to ask Liz live um, in the talk and all that and kind of incorporate it into Coffee Break. It's going to be like a more, I don't want to say like an interview, is more casual, more like just a chat of talking about their life and what brought them to be able to do this. Um, in hopes of maybe we can inspire more people to want to get involved and do these things and see how, you know, they did, how these people did it and how we can, you know, create our own story um, from there. Then on Thursday, we're going to get into a little bit of shark romance with National Geographic Explorer Tanya Pelamete. Um, she's going to take us on a, a fun adventure into the world of shark and ray pre-production. Um, really, really interesting stuff here. If you don't know about sharks and how they reproduce or rays and everything like that, it's a very, very interesting topic. Um, and then on Friday, we come back, I'll be switching seats again, Ellen will be taking over as host, and I'm going to be presenting with Frida Lara, um, and we're doing a talk about the history of sharks. We're going to look at, you know, where sharks came from, how they started to evolve and everything like that, and go through like the golden age of sharks, look at some of the really cool sharks that used to inhabit our oceans and everything, um, especially, you know, everyone's favorite, the Megalodon, we're going to talk about that a bit, we're going to talk about unicorn sharks and all these other really, really cool sharks that used to exist in history. Um, some of them really crazy looking and, you know, just bizarre animals and everything like that, but super, super, super cool. Um, and one of the things I should mention this week, it was really cool. And I mean, uh, if you look at all the guests we have, they're actually all from the same research center, from Baleos Kakuna. Um, these guys are based in La Paz. Um, Mauricio, actually, that's going to be with us today, is one of the founders and the director of it. Um, they are doing incredible work with pelagic animals, with sharks, rays, and all this kind of stuff. Um, not just here over in Baja, but all over, like really, really amazing work. Um, so I definitely recommend checking out their website and uh, following them on Facebook and Instagram and everything like that. Um, if you can make a donation towards their uh, research and all that, you can definitely do that through their website and all. Um, but they've got some really incredible projects that they've been working on and everything like that. It's just really, really awesome stuff. Um, then on Saturday this week, we're going to wrap up Shark Week with a special Project Aware Shark Conservation course. Um, I'll be teaching it with Ellen on Saturday. Um, so if you're interested in learning more about shark conservation and how you can get involved and how you can help out sharks and everything like that and be a shark advocate, um, definitely sign up for that. It is a paddy course and all that. Um, at the moment, you have to, to you get like a certificate of completion for doing the theory portion. And if you want to go on to do the diving portion later on, you can actually get a PADI certification that counts towards your master scuba diver rating um, or just, uh, you know, go through the course with the theory just to learn how you can get involved more and help sharks more and everything like that. Um, give me one sec. Let me just check on now and see where we, how we're doing. Perfect. Cool. Um, so, Marisa, if you want to turn on your video, we can jump into there. It seems he's got it all sorted now. 
the um, next week after this, we've got another really cool week coming. Um, something really, really special that we've been working on. We've decided to do an entire week devoted to our mammalian cousins that live in the ocean. Um, so we're going to be looking at whales, dolphins, uh, marine animal rescues, the vaquita, all sorts of really cool stuff. And we've got some really incredible guests coming in next week. We've got Ted Cheeseman, who's the founder of Happy Whale, um, which is an incredible like crowd, uh, crowdsourced uh, citizen science project where you've got thousands of people all over the world uh, submitting whale identification data. Um, we've also got Ricky coming in who's from the Marine Rescue Center here in Baja. Um, these are the guys that are going out and rescuing whales that are entangled or sea lions that get caught in nets or you know injured animals in the ocean and all that. Really really cool. He's going to teach us a little bit about what they're doing on the front lines and how they're getting involved in all this kind of cool stuff. Um, and then we've got Rachel coming, who's the founder of Empty the Tanks, which is a really awesome organization working to get dolphin, uh, swim with dolphin places kind of closed down and, you know, moving dolphins to sanctuaries and these kind of things so they're not in captivity anymore. Um, she's going to be talking about some of the successes they've had with creating the world's first dolphin sanctuary with the Rickleberry Dolphin Project and all that. Um, really, really cool stuff. And then on Friday, we wrap it up with Hiram coming in to, uh, Hiram's going to be talking about his work with in well and cetacean conservation in Mexico. Um, he's one of the lead researchers that works on the Vaquita project with Sea Shepherd. Um, he also works with humpback whales, gray whales, dolphins, all sorts of uh, cetaceans here in Mexico and trying to protect them and all that kind of stuff. So really, really interesting things. Um, really, really cool stuff coming that week. And then we also have a special whale conservation course that we'll be giving called Whale Defender. It's a project we built with Sea Shepherd and everything on the, that Saturday. But that's enough for me. I'm blabbing away and everything like that. Mauricio, how are you doing today, man? Very good. Thank you very much. Thank you for this invitation. Ah, oh, no problem. Brother. We're glad to have you. Um, so Mauricio, like I said, is a great, he's a shark researcher. He works with great whites as well as many other sharks and everything like that. We've done some work with them, uh, with him on uh, shark research trips in Socorro and everything like that. Amazing, amazing person. So without further ado, I hand it over to you, brother. I'm going to stop sharing my screen and let you uh, rock and roll. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to share my screen. Uh, excellent. Okay, so uh, the first part of the talk, I'm going to talk uh, about the biology of the white shark. And then in the second half, I'm going to explain to you all the things that we have done uh, about the research in Mexican waters. So first of all, when you hear the word shark, everybody thinks about this movie that was in every single movie theater all over the planet at the same time in 1975. In this movie, they showed this uh, man-eater monster that was feeding on people uh, in a little town in the east coast of the United States. Unfortunately, since everybody saw this movie, they relate sharks with these serial killers. And this was really bad for sharks because everybody thought that sharks were not good for the planet. But as you know, Sharks have been on this planet for 400 million years and they have a very specific role, which is to keep in role the population of their prey. In the case of the white shark, they have been here for 11 million years. And for me, this is the most perfect predator on earth. If you go to one of these places like uh, South Africa, Australia, New Zealand, or California, this is what you get to see. The most beautiful pre predator. As you see, their belly is white, and that's why they are called white sharks. In the dorsum, they are very dark. And actually, they know that. And they use that as camouflage. I'm going to show you footage of these animals going to the bottom because they know that they are dark in the dorsum, and they are trying to ambush their prey. So this is the most perfect animal. As you see, it's very hydrodynamic. And actually, they can reach 40 kilometers per hour. The name of the species is Carcarodon carcarius, which comes from the Greek carcaros, which means rough, odus too, and carcarius, man-eating shark. So since the beginning, the, the guy that described this animal thought that actually it was a monster. Why? Because of this beautiful set of jaws that they have. So I'm gonna show you a close-up of the jaws. When they are smaller than three meters, their teeth are slender because they feed on fish and uh, other sharks. But when they are larger than three meters, their teeth become triangular and serrated. 
because they switched to marine mammals. They got more fat and that's what they are looking for. Fat actually has twice caloric value than the proteins. The strength of the bite of the wildchuck is two tons per square inch. And they can remove 30 kilograms, 60 pounds of meat in every bite. And as you see, they have multiple rows of teeth. And actually, uh, there was a study, a very interesting study lately, and they checked how many bacteria do they have and they found 18 different species of bacteria in their teeth. Let's talk now about, about the body parts. Those are called the nostrils and they are just, just for the smell. The snout is very hydrodynamic. The eye, I don't remember it if, if, if you saw the movie. In the movie, they, they say that it's black with no light, but that's nothing like that. It's really beautiful and actually the iris is blue. If you go to Guadalupe, to Guadalupe Island, you will be able to see this. Then we have the gills, very long gill slits in the case of the, of the white shark. And maybe this is the most famous part of the white shark, the first dorsal fin. That's what you saw in the movie, chasing the naked women and the helicopters and everybody at the surface with the music. Like dun, 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 dun. Then we have the tail. And at the base of the tail, they have a structure that is called the keel, which is an extra attachment point for these muscles. As I told you, they can reach 40 kilometers per hour and jump outside of the water. I will, so, I will show you pictures of this. Then we have the pectoral fins. And if you want to know if it's a male or a female, you have to look to the pelvic fins. So we have here a male and a female. In the case of the female, they have the two pelvic fins and an opening that is called the cloaca. They can excrete the urine, uh, the excrement, and also they can have their babies through that opening. In the case of the males, they have the pelvic fins and two finger-like structures, and those are called the claspers. Why do they have two? Because they are modifications of the pelvic fins, but they cannot <laughs> mate with two females at the same time. Most of the times, we think that they use the right one. Um, as you know, when the sharks mate, the female grabs the, pe the pectoral, the male grabs the pectoral fin of the female, and then they put them upside down and they go to something that is called tonic immobility. They cannot move. So it's easier for the male to introduce the semen into the female's cloaca. This picture was taken in Guadalupe Island and it's the only record that we have of this behavior. It is called class per flaring. And I have seen this with other species like the silky sharks, the Galapagos, or the white tip reefs, for instance, in Revillagigedo. When they are about to mate, that's what they do. And we saw this in Guadalupe Island. So this is one of the hypotheses that probably the white sharks are mating in these aggregation sites like California and Guadalupe Island. In the case of the fin, oh, look, look at this. This is a, a picture of, of a Galapagos shark that I took in, uh, in Traviajijero. So as you see, they do that when they're about to mate. In the case of the females, they have two uterus and they can have from two to 15 pups, one, five. And when they're inside of the female's uterus, the female sends unfertilized eggs and the babies are going to feed on this until, until they are born. And when they are born, they are big. They are like four to five feet. But the female, it's not going to take care of them. There is no parental care. So what they do is that they deliver their pups in something that is called a nursery area. Shallow areas with a lot of food and no predators. And they have to look for their own food. So how do they do that? They have the hearing, smell, sight, something that is called the lateral line. They can detect the movement of other animals close to them. And at the end, el electroreception and taste. So let's talk a little bit about the hearing. They have two pores. If you want to see the pores of the shark, you have to look to that part in the back of their heads. They have two little pores and they are called the endolymphatic pores and they can listen to very, very low frequencies. Like when a fish is dying, they emit these low frequencies and they know that that fish is dying. In the case of the smell, up to 20% of the brain of the white shark is just for the smell. They have the best sense of smell of all the sharks. In the case of the sight, they have a very acute uh, sight uh, also. And I don't know if you have seen this uh, behavior that they roll their eyes back. It's not because they are possessed. It's because they are trying to protect their eyes. This is a picture that I took in Guadalupe Island. And as you see, you can see tooth marks in below the eyes. And it's because a, Guadalupe, a California 
sea lion was trying to bite their eyes. They know that they are very important and that's why they were trying to bite their eyes. And that's why the sharks roll their eyes back in order to protect them. This is in Guadalupe. And when you try to attack the sharks, they use bait. But the shark do not know if that bait is alive or not. And that's why they roll their eyes back. So they are blind for a few seconds. And unfortunately, that's why we have had so many accidents in Guadalupe, because they are blind for maybe four or five seconds. And when they realize they're just in front of the cage. Unfortunately, some of these animals are juveniles and they are small and they can fit through the openings of the, of the cages. I'm gonna show you this footage. Uh, it happened a few years ago and somebody gave uh, bait to one of these sharks with a plastic rope. So the shark was very stressed. You are gonna see now that it has a plastic rope in the right side of its head and it's trying to get rid of it, but it can't. The guys in this boat didn't know, so they threw the bait and they were trying to lure the shark close to the cages. But since the shark was very stressed, it didn't realize that it was in between the cages and there was an accident. So look at that. Since they, it was a juvenile, they can fit between the barbs and that's why now we're working with the Mexican government in order to change the cages and avoid this kind, this kind of incidents. This is another sense, the Ampil of Lorenzini. It's one of my favorite. If you see a shark, they have all these pores in their snout and they use this for a lot of different things. They can detect the electricity of the prey, the temperature of the water, the salinity, and also the electromagnetic field of the earth. So they know what is the north, what is the south, what is the east, and what is the west. The second longest migration ever made by a marine organism was made by a white shark from South Africa to Australia back and forth. 7,000 miles this way and 7,000 miles this other way. In the past, we thought that they didn't do that. And they can be all over the planet between the 60 degrees north and the 60 degrees south. In the past, there were very good places to see them like California, South Africa, Australia, New Zealand. In Japan, they have caught a lot of pregnant females. But what about Mexico? Unfortunately, before 2000, we didn't have a lot of information. Enough information that we had was based on dead organisms, giving a very little insight into the biology and the behavior of these animals. Most of the records that we had were in the Sea of Cortez and also in two islands, Cedros and San Benito in the Mexican Pacific. But now, the best place to see them is Guadalupe Island. Guadalupe Island is located in the Mexican Pacific at about 132 miles to the west. It is a big island. It is like 19 miles per 6.5 miles. Most of the boats uh, set their anchors in the northeast because it is the protected place. We have up to 10 boats going to Guadalupe year after year. What about the ongoing research? Uh, the Flegin Institute deployed more than 100 satellite transmitters in these animals. And it's a device like this. So you set this device in the shark and it's gonna take uh, information about the temperature and the depth preferences, and also it can give you the uh, location of these animals. So it's very good for migrations. After 12 months, it detached from the shark and it goes to the surface. And with this little antenna, it sends the information to your email. So it's amazing because you can know what do they do when they depart from Guadalupe Island. And with these devices, they have found that they can go as far as Hawaii and also to a place between Hawaii and Guadalupe Island. Another scientist from California attacked the white sharks there with the same kind of transmitters and they found the same. They can go as far as Hawaii and also to this place between Hawaii and Guadalupe Island. And that's why they call this place the White Shark Cafe because they stay there for 140 days. What are they doing? There's a lot of hypotheses about it. Some people believe that they are mating. Some people believe that they are feeding. But so far, we do not know. For my PhD thesis, I really wanted to know why the wild sharks uh, come to Mexican waters and remain here for up to six months. And food is very important. In some places, like the Farion Island, the presence of the wild shark is related with the presence of their prey. In this case, the northern elephant seal. And in Guadalupe Island, I have seen the three species of seals with scars inflicted by the wild sharks. This is the first one. This is the California sea lion. They are very smart and very agile, 
And actually, they take advantage of the good visibility in Guadalupe Island, which can be for 100 feet, and they make fun of the white sharks. Look at this picture. They hold their tail. It was even in its Facebook. I love riding sharks. <laughs> but they do this just in Guadalupe because they are smart, they are very agile, and visibility is great. They wouldn't do this in California, for instance. This is another species. This is called the Guadalupe four seal. Every time that I find these dead bodies, I find them like that, with no head. But they do not fit in the rest of the body. We do not know why. It's very interesting. Actually, I, I have a student and we are trying to test if they have something uh, particular in their, in their brain, for instance, some, some fatty acids or something, to let us know why they are just fitting on the head and they do not like the rest of the body. And this is the favorite prey, the northern elephant seal. Look at those teeth marks. This is another picture of the juvenile with, with a big bite in the chest. This is a big male. This is like a beach master. And look, in the lower part of the body, it has a bite also. This is a big female. Actually, this is a pregnant female of a northern elephant seal. And look at that bite. Probably that shark was really, really big. Look at this picture. This is what happened in December when most of the seals are coming back from Alaska and they are trying to get to Guadalupe in order to, to, to give birth and also to mate. This is a good bite because it was in the head. That's the way that you have to kill a seal. Remove the head or remove the lower part of the back. One day I was in Guadalupe and this captain called me on the radio and he told me, Mauricio, I think that somebody is shooting the seals with a shotgun. And I went, what? So I went to the beach and I checked and I saw a lot of seals with these rounded scars. So you are not going to believe this, but I can talk with the seals. So I asked them, what's happening? And they were like, I don't know, <laughs> but something is happening. And, I, and, and we saw those uh, scars, not just in the seals, but also in dolphins, fish, and even in white sharks. So we started CSI Guadalupe Island in order to see who's doing that. And we found it. It is called the cookie cutter shark. It's a very small shark, it's like 42 centimeters, but look at the size of their teeth. Huh? But how can they get a seal or a fish or even a white shark? There's one hypothesis that says that they look like squid. And also they have bioluminescence. So they pretend that they are a, a prey and when they predator is about to get them, they just move and they take a big chunk of meat. This is the most dangerous shark in Guadalupe Island. Not the white shark, but the cookie cutter shark. So what do we do when we are in Guadalupe Island? We have to take pictures, underwater pictures of the sharks in order to identify them. Uh, first of all, we have to know their size. In the past, we thought that the biggest shark was six meters because there was a big female caught in Cuba and she was six meters. But in 2013, I was with Discovery Channel doing a documentary and we found the biggest shark ever filmed. We took footage with a drone from above and she was the same size of my boat and my boat is 6.5 meters. I uploaded this video on my Facebook and I had like more than 10 million views. The most beautiful and amazing white shark ever seen, the biggest. And it was recorded in Guadalupe Island in 2013. She was seen in 1999, just for once. Then we saw her in November 2013. And then she was seen in Hawaii at the beginning of last year. So it's an amazing animal. And I will tell you more about her because we saw her again. We saw her at the beginning of the day and day in the afternoon. And I will let you know what we did with her. It was amazing. Okay, so size is good. Also, we have to know the, the sex, if it is a male or a female. Uh, we take the pictures of the pigmentation patterns in three different parts of the body, the gills, the pelvic fins, and the tail. And also, if they have some conspicuous characteristics, such as birthmarks, lacerations, or even bites inflicted by other white sharks. Look at this picture. This is a male that I saw a few years ago. His name is Meli, and look at that big tumor. I wanted to take a biopsy. So that's me with a pole spear 
He didn't have a special teeth. So I wanted to get close to the shark in order to take a biopsy because I wanted to see what it was because it was a huge tumor and it was going bigger and bigger and bigger. So we couldn't take the biopsy because it was very close to the eye. But the day after, I used a bait and we lured the shark close to the boat and we were able to take a biopsy. And we are about to publish this paper, but it's, this, this is called a neoplasm, an abnormal mass of tissue. So some people believe that they do not get cancer. There are 22 different species of sharks with cancer. So they can also get cancer. Also, we have seen cameras in the dorsal fin with National Geographic, and we are tagging the sharks with ultrasonic transmitters in order to know what do they do. So how do you set this transmitter? I have to be on the cage, and when I see the shark that I want to tag, I go out with this ball spear, and I have to shoot at the base of the dorsal fin, and then that transmitter sends a signal with the temperature and the depth of that shark. So we have to follow the shark with a boat, with a, with a receiver and a, in a hydrophone. And we have to follow the sharks for periods of 24 hours. So it's amazing because you get to see what they do for a day. And we have found very interesting things. The juveniles remain close to the shore and from 50 meters to the surface. But in the case of the bigger sharks, bigger than three meters, they remain away from the shore and from 200 meters to 300 meters. They actually behave like two different species. It's amazing, amazing what we found in Guadalupe Island with this kind of technology. And another thing that is very interesting about Guadalupe is that it is a volcanic island. It's away from the shore. Uh, so very close from the shore, you can find great depths. Actually, the boats set their anchors from 50 to 70 meters, but if you move a little bit more, it goes to 100 meters, 200 meters, 300 meters. And that's why the sharks behave differently in Guadalupe. And my hypothesis was that they were patrolling in deep waters because I found this behavior with telemetry. What are they looking? In 2008, we used two submersibles in order to find the potential prey for the juveniles in shallow waters and the potential prey and the behavior of the big sharks away from the shore, 200 meters, 300 meters. So we used two submersibles. The little one can go to 150 meters and it's for two persons. And the other one can go to 450 meters and it's for three persons. Look at this picture, we're inside of the submersible and it's amazing. So what, what we did is that with the little submersible, we did dives very close to the shore from 100 to 150 meters. And we found a lot of potential prey for these animals. Mackerel, mola mola, sardines, bat rays, scorpion fish, flatfish, yellowfin tuna. Look at this. The bat rays actually are very important because they have been found as a potential prey item of juveniles in other areas, such as California. So in this video, you can see that we're at the bottom. These are about 100 meters, and it was full of these uh, bat rays. So that's why the juveniles do not go away from the shore because they have a lot of prey very close to the shadows. Look at this, you're gonna see a yellowfin tuna and then a juvenile whoo, right there <laughs> trying to get it. When they are smaller, they are faster and they can try to get the tunas. In the case of the big sharks, look at this. We have the temperature and the depth on this graph. And as you see, it is very deep, 200 meters, 200 meters. And then when it comes to the surface, it's close to a northern elephant seal colony. And that's why I had the hypothesis, hypothesis that they were looking for seals in deep water. And if they were not lucky, they were going to the shore close to their colonies in order to see if they were successful. We set a critter camp in one of a, a big male. His name is Bruce. And look at this footage. This is Bruce, very close to the bottom. We set the, the fin camp in the dorsal fin. So you have a very, amazing POV of what the shark is looking. As you see, it's very close to the bottom because it knows about the dark dorsum. So it's just trying to ambush prey, looking up in order to see if they see the silhouettes of their prey. We never were able to see an attack, but it was amazing to see that they remain very close to the bottom, taking advantage of their pigmentation. We use the big submersible in order to find the potential prey for the sharks, for the bigger sharks and three meters, and also to see their behavior. And I will show you footage of two amazing things that we saw. The first video, it's a red octopus feeding on the squat lobster. 
And the second one, it's uh, from an animal that is called a chimera, which is very weird. So this is the first video. We were at about 380 meters. There was a cave. And then when we turned on the lights of the submersible, the octopus saw this squat lobster, and you will see what's going to happen. Look at the, uh, the eye of the octopus. It knows that the squat lobster is there. So little by little, it's coming closer and closer. The squat lobster is not moving at all. It's pretending that it's dead. But look at the, look what the octopus is about to do. Oh, <laughs> look at that boom. Amazing, we were super excited about this kind of behavior because we never saw something like that before. And then we moved a little bit, we, we went deeper and we saw this animal. I never thought that I was going to see this animal dead and we saw them alive. It is called chimera because it's like a mixture of different animals. In the case of this species, is the spotted dwarfish. And it's a relative of the sharks. Also their body, it's made of cartilage. But as you see, they move with the pectoral fins. They have a spine in the first dorsal fin, but they are very, very weird animals. And we saw a lot of them in Guadalupe Island. So we found a lot of potential prey for the big sharks in deep waters. But, but my hypothesis was that they were looking for the northern elephant seals in deep water. Look at this picture. This is a white shark below 100 meters, and it is patrolling. It's looking for something. Look at this video. We were uh, below 200 meters, I think. It's really dark. But then we saw right at the slope a big female. You will see that we are going to turn on the lights right there. And you can see this female was almost as big as deep blue. She was probably like, I don't know, like six meters. She was really, really big. And she was right at the slope. And as you see, you cannot see them. Just if you turn on the lights is when you are able to see their belly. But if you do not have lights, like the seals, it's very hard to see them. So the sharks know that. And that's why they are patrolling in deep water trying to ambush the northern elephant seals. That was my hypothesis, that they were there, okay, I was not successful, then I will go closer to the surface, close to the colony, to see if I can get a northern elephant seal. And this is what they do. They take advantage of the good visibility, they follow the seal, and they remove the lower part of the body or the head, and they just follow the dead carcass to the surface. In 2013, Discovery Channel came to Guadalupe Island with this device that is called Automatic Underwater Vehicle, AUV. So we had to set a transponder in the dorsal fin of the shark, and this transponder sends a signal to the AUV, and the AUV can follow the shark for 3.5 hours, taking readings about the temperature, the depth, the speed, the topography, and also it has six cameras. So you can see what the shark is looking. So he, here we are, I am there with, uh, with a friend of mine, with Dr. Greg Scomo, and we are trying to set this transponder in a shark. So we were luring, waiting for a shark, and guess who came? Deep Blue. The biggest shark ever filmed came to us, so we were able to set the transponder. We released the AUV, and the AUV followed Deep Blue for 3.5 hours, and we got amazing footage. Look, these are the cameras. So you can see up, down, left, right, in the center, and also back. So as you see, that's deep blue. She's very close to the bottom, taking advantage of her dark pigmentation. Look at that, you cannot see her. It's, it's hard to see her actually. And she just look up in order to see if she can find the silhouettes of potential prey. When, when the AUV was following uh, deep blue, the engineer told me, Mauricio, the AUV is, is moving very awkward. Do you know if, if there is a current or something? And I was like, I don't know. Let's, let's bring it back to see what happened. So we brought the AUV back. And this is the camera that it's uh, looking back. This is at about uh, 96 meters. And we wanted to see what happened. So we, oh my God. <laughs> so we were looking and boom, we had this attack. Look, one bite, two bites. 
three bytes, four, <laughs> five bytes. This is the first attack of a white shark ever filmed in deep water. This is 96 meters, and we got attacks from 96 meters to 267 meters. So this is the first time that we got this ever, and it was in Guadalupe Island. The white sharks take advantage of the good visibility, and they can, uh, they can attack in deep water. So this is me checking the AUV. We got nine attacks in the first expedition. I am super happy because I tested my hypothesis. But look, look at these guys, they are super afraid because this device is $1 million. And it was attacked by nine different sharks. So this is what happened to a real seal. They removed the lower part of the body and they just followed the carcass to the surface. Look at this, this is what you get to see in December. You get to see the dorsal fins, you get to see a lot of birds in blood all over the bay. It's amazing, it's unbelievable. Uh, so this is happening in December because most of the seals are coming back. And the sharks know that, and that's why they remain in deep water, taking advantage of this prey. Look at this. So you get to see the birds, and when you get close, you, you see the dead body, and then you get to see the sharks feeding at the, at the surface. Look at this footage. We took this footage in Guadalupe uh, in September, actually. And look at this. That's the seal. And you will see the shark coming. In every bite, they can take 30 kilograms of meat and blubber. This is amazing. And sometimes you get to see more sharks. Look at this. We have one shark there, another shark there. That day we saw seven sharks at the same time. So, but they don't want to have a fight because they are very smart. And they know that they have this very powerful jaws. So what they do, it's a display in order to avoid a fight. And I will show you examples of this. This is like the confrontation. Another one is the parallel swimming. They swim very close to each other. Look at this video. We had two males. And they were like, okay, let's see who's bigger. So they come very close, it's not with snout, in order to see who's bigger. And the bigger shark is the one that feed on the baits first. So they are not stupid. A lot of people believe that they are stupid, but they are actually very smart. This is another one that is called gaping. They open their mouth and they keep it like that, showing the upper teeth and the lower teeth to the opponent. Breaches. In Guadalupe, they do this. But my hypothesis is that they are not doing this to feed, like in South Africa. You have seen those videos that they jump out of the water, getting the seals. It's not happening in, in Guadalupe. In Guadalupe, when you get to see two or three males at the same time, sooner or later, one of them is going to do this. They, look at this, look at this picture. This is full body, out of the water. And as you see, it's a male. So after they jump, they let know the other opponents that they are bigger. It's like, get away, I am bigger than you, and I don't want to have a fight. Look at this footage. We took this footage from underwater. That's now. That's a very nice male. I named it after me. Look at this. It jumps out of the water. Boom. And then that splash let know the other shark that he's bigger. This is my favorite. I have just footage of this. I have just two videos of this. I call it the head shaking. And you will see that we had two sharks that day. And look, they open their mouth, and again, <laughs> can you see that? They open their mouth in order to show their teeth to the opponent. And this is another, another video. Again, this is a male. It's coming. There's another male in the other side. And look, did you see that? They open their mouth, and they show their teeth. It's amazing. I have just two videos of this, but it's a great, great display. What happened if the display didn't work? Well, then there's going to be a confrontation. And they attack the head, the gills, the pectoral fins, or even the tail. I'm going to show you footage of a big female attacking a little juvenile. And you will see that they attack the gills. Look at this. Boom. Directly to the gills. This is a picture of a big male. The name is Bruce. It's a five-meter male. And look at that big bite. So imagine the size of the other shark that inflicted that bite. So that's what they do. When, when the display is not working, okay, let's fight. And they attack this part, the gills, because it's highly vulnerable. This is a juvenile with a big scar inflicted by, by a bigger shark, and that's why they remain away from the shore. In 2015, we brought another AUV that can go deeper, and we found something amazing. This is the first footage 
of a one child sleeping. So we saw that they go to places with a lot of current and they remain like motionless, just moving a little bit. Look at the mouth of the shark. It's keeping the mouth open. So the current is very strong and they just remain in that part. This at about 10 p.m. And we thought that the transmitter failed because it was not moving at all. But it is because it is at the south of the bay where the current is very strong and they just keep their mouth open in order to breathe. When the AUV hit the shark, you could see that the shark went away. So this is the first footage of a white shark sleeping. It was amazing. So also what we want to do this year is to keep tracking the sharks because now we want to know the effect of the ecotourism on these animals. And also we're going to set cameras in their dorsal fin, but these cameras can be in their fins for periods of 24 hours or 48 hours. So we will be able to know what are they looking for periods of two days. Also, we will set these kind of transmitters, the mini pads, especially in the juveniles, because we have seen that after Guadalupe, they go back to their nursery areas. So we would like to know if they go to California or to Biscayne Bay, which is a well-known nursery area for the white shark. Because unfortunately, in Mexico, the fishermen, some fishermen are getting juveniles. Look at that shark, that's a white shark. It's a little tiny juvenile. Look at the little claspers. It's a little male. So unfortunately, we have all these records of the babies that have been caught uh, close to the shore in Mexican waters. Also for us, kids are very important. And that's why we started a comic about the life of a marine biologist. His name is Mauricio, I don't know why, but the story says that he was in Guadalupe with, with his captain. And then they saw these illegal fishermen killing white sharks, so they tried to save them. But one of the illegal fishermen hit Mauricio in the head, so he goes to the bottom of the ocean. But one shark saves him and takes him with the shark goddess, Deep Blue. And this goddess gave Mauricio special power to protect sharks in Mexican waters. I'm going to show you a little cartoon about this. So this is when uh, the marine biologist is in the cave, and then Deep Blue comes, and she's like, if you want to help us, I can give you special powers. And then he becomes a superhero that is going to protect sharks in Mexican waters. We have three uh, comics. The first one about Guadalupe Island. The second one about the bull sharks in Playa del Carmen. And the third one about Revi Yajijero Archipelago. So kids are important for us. And look at this picture. That's me when I was like one year old, one year and a half. And I had in my hand, a little white shark, and this is me a few years after with the real white shark. Thank you so much. If you have any questions, please let me know. And that, that was an incredible presentation. Thank you so much for that, Mauricio. Beautiful, right. beautiful. The, the deep blue attacking the AB is just like, wow, that's incredible footage. Unbelievable. Um, awesome. So, guys. Anyone have any questions for uh, anything like that? You can type them into the Q&A box and we'll uh, get them read out and everything like that. Um, we've already got a few of them coming in. So let's uh, start with that. So Yvette says, um, it's not a question, just a massive thank you for all the work you and your team are doing for our marine life. I was at Guadalupe Island last September. Um, yeah. Thanks for your ocean story today, uh, Yvette from the UK. Thank you. Awesome. So. Jose says, uh, thanks for your amazing talk, Mauricio. What are the primary senses that the great whites are using to navigate in, in near total darkness at the lower depths? We think, we think that uh, they are using the ampule of Lorenzini. In that video that you saw, uh, actually, we thought that they were losing their, that the, 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 the transmitters detached from the shack somehow because they were not moving from a specific area but it was because they were at the south of the bay, right where the current is very strong, and they were very really close to the bottom. So they can use the ampule of Lorenzini when they are close to the bottom in order to know what, where they move. Actually, we think that the scale of hammerheads use that in order to orientate when they are moving from the islands to other parts. Awesome. And then one more question from Jose it says, also, do they have enhanced regeneration or healing abilities because of the injuries obtained from other sharks and prey? Very good question. Actually, that shark that, that I showed you, uh, Bruce, with the big bite, one year after, it was perfectly healed. It is amazing. They have a very good healing process. If it is in the pectoral fins or in the dorsal fin, they cannot 
fix it. But if it is in the body, they can heal it perfectly. That's incredible. It's amazing. Such a fast healing. Um, Luca asks, how can I stay in touch to know the latest news about your research? And uh, um, he said also there's amazing footage. Ah, uh, yeah, actually I'm going to put here my, uh, my, the, the social media. Can you see it? Okay. So you can go to our website right there, pelagioscacuja.org. And we can, I mean, we are telling everything about all the things that we are doing in, not just in Guadalupe, but in all the different projects that we have. Awesome. And you guys have so many incredible projects going on. It, it's unbelievable. What I'll also do is I'm going to throw the link to the website into the chat for everyone too. If you want it, you can just click on it or copy paste it and save it for later too. So this way you got it everywhere. Awesome. Thank you, Luca. Um, Sue asked, do we know how much a great white needs to eat to survive and how long that they live for? Yeah, well, that's a good question. Uh, actually, in the past, they thought that they had to feed all the time. But there was a study and they gave 30, like 60 pounds of seal meat to a shark with a transmitter uh, with a temperature sensor. So you can know if a shark is feeding again because you get this record of a decrease in the temperature because water enters in the stomach and then you can see an increase in the temperature because of the digestion. And they found that they can stay without feeding for up to 18 days. So they don't have to eat all the time like everybody thought. And now there's a new study uh, to know their age, uh, which, is, which is called the carbon pump. In order to know the age of a shark, you have to look for the vertebrae. They have rings of growth. But with this method, it is very accurate. And they found that they can live for up to 73 years. So that's amazing. And it's uh, very recent information. Wow. That's incredible. I mean, 18 days without food and 73 years old, oh, that, that's amazing. I don't really want yeah. Uh, so let's see. Fernanda says, "Amazing talk. Thank you. Could you repeat the force of their bite? And also, where can we get the comics?" Okay, the strength is like 1.8 tons per square inch, and the comic we are going to put it in our website, which is www.pelagioscacuja.org. So we will have the three comics on PDF, and you can download them from there. Oh, that is awesome. I can't wait to see it. Yeah, I mean, super cool. Awesome. So Caesar says, man, awesome presentation. So proud that there are Mexican people working on these subjects with that kind of passion and commitment. Um, maybe you said this at the beginning of your presentation, but do you make um, independent research or where is your workplace? Yeah, well, we, we do, we have an NGO, which is called a nonprofit organization, which is, which is called uh, Pelagios Cacuja. So we work in different areas. We have projects in Guadalupe Island with white sharks, Revilla Gijedo Archipelago with 11 species of sharks, Clipperton Atoll with like also like seven species of sharks, the Sea of Cortez in Cabo Pulmo in different areas with a lot of different species. And also we're working with people from other marine protected areas such as Malpelo with some, uh, Dr. Sandra Besudo, uh, Cocos with Dr. Randall Arauz, uh, Galapagos with Dr. Alex Fern. So we also belong to a bigger uh, uh, group that is called Migramar. So we are trying to understand the migratory patterns of the sharks because they do not respect human boundaries. I mean, they can travel long distances and we are trying to protect them, not just in isolated nations, but in different and bigger and broader areas. I think that, I mean, the, the work you guys are doing with Mega is just incredible, like how trying to, you know, link everything together and all that to be able to better protect them is such an amazing idea. Really, really great work. Awesome idea. Um, Christine says, uh, wow, so informative and amazing shots. Do the, only the males intimidate each other for food or do females do it too? Do you know what? I have seen that uh, females are bigger, way bigger. I mean, if you want to go to Guadalupe, uh, and if you want to see the big females, you have to go in October or November. If you go in August and September, visibility is great. You get to see a lot of sharks, but you do not get to see the big females. So I have seen that when you have males, they, they do these displays because they are the same size and they are not as big. But, but when you get to see a big female, the males go away. Because there's like a hierarchy, which is based on size. 
But if you get to see two big females at the same time, then you get to see also the displays. But most of the time, when a big female arrives, the males go away because they are so big. <laughs> They're like, quick, run, get out of here. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Awesome. Alexander asks, uh, do you think that electricity from cameras or electronic devices increases the shark bites to these devices? Well, you know what? I have, I have talked with people from uh, Bahamas and especially with the tiger sharks, it seems that the tiger sharks are attracted to the, to the specifically to the flashes of the divers. I have a friend and uh, one tiger shark got his camera and he took it like seven meters away and he dropped it. So it seems that somehow, I mean, it, it makes sense that they can detect these small uh, electric fields and, and that's why they are so attracted to this. Also, what we have seen in Guadalupe is that they bite the, the engines because uh, they are made of metal and they create a galvanic current and they are attracted by this. It's not that they are trying to, to, to feed on the engine, but they are attracted because they can detect all these uh, currents with their acrylic Lorenzini. That's really interesting. It's incredible the senses they have. Um, Anonymous asks, she said, uh, hello there. What do you say regarding the fact that it seems that great whites attack surfers most likely because they confuse them with seals when they are surfing on their boards? Yeah, unfortunately, when you, when you get to see a, a surfer from underneath, they really look like a seal. So in most of the cases, when the shark grabs the surfer, they remove, I mean, they do not feed on, on that uh, person. Actually, there was an incident, I don't like to say an attack. There was an incident uh, in uh, November 2018 here in the Sea of Cortez. Uh, a local diver was trying to get seashells and Unfortunately, he was, uh, I mean, we, we think that it was a white shark because of the radius of the bite. But I asked to the guy that was in the boat, did you see if the shark came to the surface to feed on the nothing? And he told me, actually, I think that he didn't like the human. So that's what we think. Actually, they have these taste buds in their tongue and also in the roof of their mouth. And with that, they can detect if it is what they want. So since 1970, no, 1980, since the 1800s, 1876, to 2010, there was a study uh, in order to understand how many attacks were inflicted by white sharks. And there were about 286 attacks. And from these, just 10% were fatal. Because in most of the cases, they do not feed on the human. Mm. Very interesting. Um, Luca asks, do you have any records of the sharks that you've tagged coming down to the Humboldt ecosystem? To the what? To the Humboldt ecosystem, like Galapagos area? Not yet, not yet. And actually, uh, the good thing is that we have tagged up to 128 sharks in Guadalupe. And in California, Dr. Salvador Jorgensen, they have tagged, and Dr. Chris Lowe, they have tagged more than 300. And the good thing is that we are using these devices. They are called underwater receivers all over the, the, the world, actually. So if one of these sharks go to, goes to Galapagos or Pocos or Malpelo or Revilla Gijedo, we will be able to know if they go. And so far, we do not have these records. We have just records of the sharks from Guadalupe going north to California, Oregon, and also to the west, Hawaii, but that's it. We do not have records of those sharks with transmitters uh, below the Sea of Cortez. Oh, wow, really interesting. Uh, Myrtle asks, she says, hello, thank you for your amazing presentation. During your research, was there ever an incident that you were attacked by sharks or anything like that? Well, to, to, to be honest, I have been working with all the, the dangerous species like the bull shark, the white shark, the tiger shark, and I have had accidents, but never related with the sharks. I mean, I was bitten by a little baby black tip when I started my career in 1998, but it was because it was really stressed. And then I was bit by a, by a Galapagos, but I was doing a surgery and the guys were not holding the head properly. So it bit me in the, in the leg, but it was just a little bit. But that's it. I mean, in most of the cases, there were just accidents, but never related with the sharks actually trying to, to bite me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's incredible. Like, it's one of those things like you diving with them, you start to see it in a very different way. Yeah, you know I mean, like I've never really had, we get asked it a lot with when we work with the Makos and things like that. Like, I've never really seen, you know, uh, aggressive behavior towards us unless the shark, like you were doing something towards the shark or something like that or stressing it. Um, cool. 
So Alexa says, this has been so incredible and informative. I have a question around white shark relationships. When they are in a group setting, do they ever create relationships in which they are codependent or are they primarily solo creatures? That's a very good question. Actually, we are trying to know that. According to Dr. Peter Klimby, he was my advisor. He thinks that they attack in groups. And also we have seen pictures, uh, uh, the, the picture that I showed you of the seal with a big bite in the head. I don't know if you saw, but it has two bites very close to each other. It's impossible that one shark did that at the same time. So we think that several different sharks are doing that at the same time. We do not have the proofs, but now we're using something that is called a mini sword, which is like a little receiver. So we are setting cameras in the dorsal fin of the sharks, but also with these little receivers. So that shark becomes a, a, a receiver. So if we are trying to tag as many sharks as possible, and then we set this little receiver in this shark, and that little receiver is going to be for two days in that shark. And we will be able to know if that shark is detecting other animals at the same time for longer periods. We have tagged six animals with those devices so far. I cannot tell you what did we find because it's, it's amazing. But this year, we will set another two, and that's it. We will be able to publish that paper. But that's a very good question, and we will answer to that this year with a publication. Awesome. Thank you. I, I've loved, I've definitely looked forward to seeing the research on that. It sounds really, really interesting. Um, cool. So Catherine says, thank you for your presentation. It was amazing. Is there any way you could share the PowerPoint presentation or something like I could read it somewhere else? Yeah, actually, uh, I, I have a link. I can send that link, that link to Jay. Uh, we have this uh, presentation like uh, on YouTube and you can see the whole thing again if you want. Awesome, that would be great. Uh, if you can send it over, actually, if you have it available, you can throw it in the chat and we can do it right now. Yeah, it's in the Pelagios uh, channel. Internet you, you dying do. issue for a moment. Can you see me? All right, let me. Jay? Okay, I think that Jay is having some issues. So I will start to answer some of the questions. What do you think about the energetic losing due to interspecific competition for debate in Guadalupe? That's a very good question. Actually, now we are trying to understand that uh, and we are setting a special transmitter uh, in, the, in the keel of the shark. So this device can detect how many times the shark is moving the tail. So with that, we will be able to calculate how much energy the shark is losing when they are in front of the ecotourism boats. Because also we would like to know if there is an, a negative effect by the ecotourism boats. That's a very good question. Uh, we set these devices already. Uh, but, uh, but this year we will try again to do it. So soon we will be able to let you know uh, what's the, the, the effect of the ecotourism in the, in the white sharks. Okay, let's see, let me see if we have another one. Okay. Okay, it seems that if you touch the sharks on their receptive parts, the Lorenzini ampullae, they, they seem like stone. Have you ever tried that? We, we haven't tried that, we haven't done it, uh, but I have seen that in other uh, areas, such as in, uh, in the Caribbean. I have seen that uh, the divers do that, and they, it is like a lot of stimulation to the ampullae of Lorenzini, but yes, I have, I have seen that. This is another one. Thank you so much for your amazing talk. It totally made me, made my day. 
Do you know more about sleeping sharks or maybe even their brain activity? Unfortunately, there's not a lot of information about this. Uh, the, the, the only footage that we have about this is the one that I had shown you. So th that's the first time that we saw a white shark sleeping. Uh, and, and it was amazing that they go to these places with a lot of current. So they remain in the same spot, just moving a little bit with their mouth open, taking advantage of this current. So that's the, the only time there's, everybody asks me about sleeping, but it's very hard to do that in, in aquariums, for instance. And another question, I heard that they have small brains. Well, the size of a 3.5 meter shark, the, the, the size of the brain is like 13 centimeters. So relatively, yes, they have small brains, but as you saw, I showed you all the, all the, the behaviors, they are not stupid at all. They are actually very smart. Okay, do you know if there is any huge migration of sharks in America? Well, uh, we have uh, found in, in the, the, that the sharks in, uh, from Guadalupe go as far as Hawaii. So this is like 3,000 and, and a half kilometers. Oh, here's Jay. How are you, Jay? I was answering questions. Oh, perfect. Thank you for taking over. I internet just decided <laughs> it didn't want to work and cut right <laughs> out. So Don't worry. continue on. I'll be right. I'm just getting it back up and running. Okay, this is another one. Is it hard to get permissions to dive in Guadalupe Island? How has been your experience working with authorities? Well, actually, I don't know if you are talking about uh, diving, like diving in the island, because now the only thing that it's uh, allowed is to do cage diving. So you go on these boats and they have uh, cages and you have to be inside of the cage. The only people allowed to do diving outside of the cage are scientists because we have to retrieve the underwater receivers. Awesome. Let me pop. Uh... Oh, all right. Continue. You can continue on for a moment. I'm still setting up. I'll let you keep rocking. <laughs> Don't worry. I had to switch to a mobile router real quick. All right. So the next question, uh, where did you leave off? You have Victoria. Did you read that question yet or no? No. Let me see. Which one is it? Victoria Lebron. So if we have an encounter with a shark, even a great white, and they confront us, um, want to uh, check on us, shall we place our hands in their ampullae of Lorenzi? Or um, well, if we don't have anything else like a camera to put distance between us and the shark? Well, actually, I, I, I tell this to everybody. Uh, you can know if a shark is going to do something because of their body language. If you see that they lower their pectoral fins, they hunch their backs and they move very awkward. That means that they are not happy with your presence. So you just have to go away, but it's very important to keep visual contact all the time. If they come to you, never use your hand. If you have your fins, you have to move like this and hit them with your fins in their snout, but never with your hand. Try to do it with your fins. If you have a GoPro stick, use that, but never use your hands. But it's very hard to see this kind of behavior. If they do, if you see the, the depression of the pectoral fins, just go away and keep visual contact all the time. That's very important. Awesome. Getting in. Uh, another question we have from Arelli. She asks, are the cages harmful for sharks? Well, I, I, I don't know if you saw that video, but uh, last year there was an, an, an accident uh, because the, the opening between the bars has to be 35 centimeters. If it is bigger than that, the juveniles can fit. And the problem is that they, they get there and they get stuck and they start to move so they can uh, break their, their gill arcs. That's why now we are working together with the Mexican government, with CONAM, uh, which is like the, the, the institution that, that uh, keeps in control of these marine protected areas. And uh, we are trying to work uh, with them to do the new good practices manual. So in that manual, we're gonna let them know how to uh, manage the, the bait, how to 
the design of the cages and different things because we really would like to avoid these kind of incidents. Thank you. Perfect. So Emin asks, uh, so this is great presentation, two questions. First one, do you have any insight or research on the interaction between white sharks and other shark species? Well, that, that's a good one. Uh, actually, we were, I have seen, just, that this is a very interesting thing. In, in Guadalupe, you get to see makos, sometimes blue sharks, horn sharks, uh, sometimes scarlet hammerheads. But when you get to see the white sharks, the other species disappear. They don't want to be around the, the, the white sharks. But twice, I have seen sharks that really didn't care about the white sharks. One day we saw a big female mako, and she actually took the, the bait first. She, and she, since she was so fast, she took two of our baits, like super, I mean, we couldn't remove the bait on time because she was so fast. And she didn't care about the, the presence of the white shark. And in another occasion, we saw a smooth hammerhead. And it was afraid of the white shark, but it, it was also trying to get the, the bait at the same time. But we have seen a hierarchy. When you get to see like a species such as tiger shark or a, or a, or a white shark, the other ones go away. There was one occasion, there's a paper, and there was a dead whale, and they saw white sharks and tiger sharks at the same time. When the white shark came, the tiger, the tiger shark went away. So there's also a hierarchy between these top predators. Really interesting. So the second question I have is, should they ask, how do you feel about chumming sharks in order to put uh, the receiver in them? Do they get stressed or they, maybe they'll get used to the food from humans or the sound of the boat engines, et cetera? Well, no, that's a good question. That's actually, we are trying to see the, the effect of the ecotourism. Uh, actually, now uh, the ecotourism operators are just allowed to use like the carcass of the fish. They remove as much as possible from the tissue and they, and they try not to give the, the, the bait to the shark. I mean, most of the time they try to do this. But also I have been there when the, when the sharks are very close to the cages and suddenly they disappear. And when you see, that they were feeding on a seal. So some people believe that this is changing the natural uh, predatory behavior, but I don't think so. I mean, fish, it's not what they need. They really need a lot of fat. And the seals, they have that because it has twice caloric value than proteins. And to, to answer the question about the, the cameras that we are setting in the, in the sharks, we lure the sharks close to the boat. And then we try to do it with uh, free divers. I have uh, two very good friends, William William and Fred Boyle, and they have uh, helped scientists from all over the planet uh, tagging sharks because it's really easy. Well, it's not really easy, but it, it is easier to tag sharks by free diving than by scuba. So what we do is that when we have the sharks closed, they just dive and set the, the mini sword, the, the little receiver in the dorsal fin of the shark. Awesome, really nice. Cool. The, so let's we'll wrap it up for today here. Once again, Marisa, thank you so much for coming in today and stopping by and everything like that. It was a great, great presentation. Great to see you again and all that. Hopefully we'll uh, catch up soon and see you soon. Um, thank you for everybody that stopped in today to listen to the chat. Sorry for a little bit of technical difficulties today and all that. Um, tomorrow we're back with Liz Parkinson for the coffee break for uh, talking about her story in shark conservation and everything like that. Um, so we'll see you tomorrow. Have a wonderful night. Ellen will be in tomorrow with you guys. So look forward to seeing everyone then. And I will be back on uh, Thursday and Friday with uh, Tanya and Frida. So have a wonderful week. Mauricio, thank you so much, brother. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. Cheers. Everybody take care. Stay safe out there. We'll see you guys soon. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you.